Wen, it's great to see you. Uh, I remember last time we saw you many years ago in a Japanese restaurant down in Soho. This movie that we're talking about, Transmissing. Uh, I want to thank you for making that. It made a change in my life. I remember seeing that very clearly, 1982. I was a second year film student at NYU Graduate School, and I saw it at NYU Student Center in Asian American Film Festival. I was not Asian American. I was Asian Asian. Mm -hmm. I was here to study, then go back to Taiwan to work. Back at that time, it was not even dreamable to work in America as a filmmaker. Right. You can dream about going to Hong Kong to make movies yeah. there, but American is another league. That's the major league we're there not dream about. I saw your movie, and then I witnessed how it was perceived. So doors opened, and new dreams start to form. Mm -hmm. Making a feature film in an artistic way, a film noir, rather, about our identity that was, uh, back then, it's just not in my head. And tell us, since you were the first one, <laughs> <laughs> tell us how this started, how did you get the money, how do you spend that 20000 how did that happen? Yeah, when I finished film school, I went back to Hong Kong. I was kind of in the same type position that you were just talking about. You come over, you study, and then you go back home. So I started working in television in Hong Kong, but I got fired after just one <laughs> summer uh, because I was probably too radical. I wanted to change everything and how they shoot things because it was shot in the studio. I wanted to take it out and into the streets. So, and they didn't like that, so I, I, they got rid of me. But that was already when Alan Fong, An Hui, the Hong Kong New Wave was beginning to happen but I didn't quite fit in. Uh, so I came back to the US. I couldn't get work in film or, or any kind of media. Uh, so I went into Chinatown to teach uh, English. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to go? And as I was doing that for a few years, I really got to know the community and I got to know a lot of interesting people. And I wanted to make a film then. I applied to a NEA grant, the National Endowment for the Arts, and I got it. It wasn't a lot of money. I think it was $12,000. And then I got a hold of a lot of Asian cameraman, sound man, and we just decided to make the movie, basically over weekends, because everyone was working during the week. And nobody got paid. We all said, well, we'll sign something, and everybody owns a film. Did you share the money? I did share. <laughs> No, I took it all. Most of them, they just took it. <laughs> New Yorker Films picked it up, and they did really well with it. So I actually ended up sharing every quarterly <laughs> with, with the guys who worked on the film. So you're yeah. a good man. <laughs> <laughs> Chen Hung lived at Hotel St. Paul. Steve and I decided to take turns and watch the hotel. The movie is obviously a film noir. You just perhaps cynically go along with the genre. Right. But at the same time, you're chasing something untractable, uh, the Chinese ID. I met all these interesting people in Chinatown, and I saw that Chinatown was not like how Hollywood was portraying the Chinese, because in those days, you were either, you know, working as a household boy or a laundryman or working in a restaurant. Uh, these characters were not that realistic. So I wanted to just show Chinatown as a lot of interesting characters that you've never seen before. And one of the ways I felt I could put them all in was to use this film noir genre and have two cab drivers looking for someone. I remember in the early 70s, I was in Taiwan. I was a theater student. I watched this movie, great movie, Chinatown, Roman Polanski. Mm. The whole movie, yeah. I was admiring it. Great movie making, great film noir. Until the very last line, they say, let's get the hell out of here. It's Chinatown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I was in Taiwan. I didn't get the metaphor. I said, these people do all these dirty things. The, the Chinese didn't do anything. Right. I didn't know that history of film noir until later, that Chinatown is actually for a long time, 
was a metaphor for the core of darkness, of noir, of the mm -hmm. unknown, of right. mystery, something you cannot figure out, enigmatic facts of life, all those things that noir is going for. It's the core of noir, probably pretty unfairly. I felt transmissing. It shone some light into the, the darkness, the noir. It's hard enough for guys like us who've been here so long to find an identity. And you're kind of like me. You come to America quite a bit earlier. You're a teenager, I guess. You, yeah. You was brought up in Hong Kong. So where was your ID? Like, I, I was always an outsider. Do you feel you're part of the yeah. inside of Chinatown in that metaphor? Yeah, well, I, my ID is pretty screwed up. I think it's more screwed up than yours. <laughs> you think so? I, yeah, maybe you can tell me. I grew up in Hong Kong. My parents were from northern China, from Shandong, and they were pretty conservative Chinese. So I was brought up very Chinese, but I went to Irish Jesuit schools, and Hong <laughs> Kong was a British colony. So I was pretty screwed up there. And then to come to America as a student during the late 60s when the whole, you know, uh, free love thing was going on. <laughs> I feel like I was an alien. I was the geek in the class, and people didn't know why I was even there. And I couldn't get girlfriends. I, I didn't have any friends even. It was a difficult, difficult time. So I don't think I'm Chinese anymore. I don't think I'm American. I don't know what I am. Uh, I think I'm a mixed up person. I mean, even today, you know, when I go back to China to do publicity, they don't think I'm Chinese. They think I'm some kind of a uh, bastard. Bastard? <laughs> yeah, and my films are all about being an outsider. Even something like Smoke, where I shot the whole film in Brooklyn. It was Paul Auster who actually kind of guided me inside, and I was looking from the outside, you know, more objectively. And I don't mind that. The benefit of outsiders is that you see the subtext uh, a lot quicker than people who know about the material. Yeah. You just see it right through it uh, right. effortlessly because you're an yeah. outsider. But uh, adaptation, like a chameleon, get familiar and make it look alike and still heartfelt. I want to be outside and inside at the same time, though. So that's what I try to do with my films. And I think you have the same kind of parallel sensibility about being an outsider. Exactly. But let's take, for example, something like Sense and Sensibility. So how do you get inside those characters and their emotions? There's something universal about humanity. The material, I feel I know them in my heart. Mm. Uh, very close to the characters. It's just I never did it in English. Right. and produce a movie, direct a movie in Major League. That was the big jump hurdle. It's actually quite scary. People keep bugging me when that movie come out. What is it to you? What do you want to do? How do you do it? Yeah. So I tend to crack jokes. I said, you know, for a Chinese director to do a repressed English person is pretty easy. Right. <laughs> Even that dry sense of humor from Jen Austin, I just felt very close to it. Right. No, I, I don't just pick anything and do it. At heart, I have to... Yeah. Make, like feel akin to it. I grew up in Taiwan, tropical Taiwan. What was in the Wyoming gay cowboy? It's not anything to do with me. <laughs> but if I cry, yeah. I read the short stories, something or loneliness or outsider, or couldn't find a way to say it, or uh, that stoic nature or repression, somehow, if it hits me here, yeah. and somehow you find a way. It's more important that you understand that humanity, which is universal, and that sense of humor that you can identify with. You can tell by the way I use my wok. I'm a Chinese cook. I'm a Chinese cook. <laughs> and I was watching all these characters in Chinatown, and I want to laugh at them, but at the same time, I want to cry <laughs> with them. That's why China's Missing may feel a little cynical sometimes. <laughs> But for me, it's mixed in. It's very ironic in that sense. But they're very funny. Yeah, okay. <laughs> or however you put it, they're funny. Okay. No, the Chinese is not like submissive and mysterious yeah. not talking. 
you cannot stop them. They're hilarious. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest surprise and success. It's like Bruce Lee showing flexing muscles. You flex some sense of humor. And all those people. We don't have one ton soup. We have one ton spelled backwards. Not now. <laughs> and later on, you make some bigger, more sophisticated movies, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. But that was the age of innocence. It just happened. It's just wonderful. Yeah, well, sometimes I think I want to go back to the days where I didn't know filmmaking that much. And even when I made Chan, you know, the film school that I went to is different from NYU. I mean, the film school I went to was an art school, and they don't teach you about narratives and telling <laughs> stories and how to even frame a camera. They teach you how to make experimental films that people don't understand. So, oh, that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you go in, you trust your instincts, and you, and you do it. You know, you don't try to polish it, and you don't try to make it all work. Or even coherent. Or even coherent, you know. But that's yeah. the, the good thing about uh, independent filmmaking and the ver virginal at attempt. You know, life is full of contradictory, ambiguity, inconsistency. Yeah. That's life. But yeah. we're not allowed to do that in film. Certainly, some of the bigger movie you make, how, how do you cope with that and still keep the facts of life, the, how we feel about life, the complexity, the ambiguity. The movie really got to me with those two water shots. Ah, okay. They, they really got me. Yeah. That's when I got lost in a good way. What's not there seemed to have just as much meaning as what is there. That's a chance missing moment for me. Yeah. It's like all Chinese are missing, or IDs missing. So that's what was going through your head, is like all Chinese identity is missing. Yeah, it's just Chinese identity for us is such a nihilist kind of a pursue. Mr. Lee says Chan Hung and immigrants like him need to be taught everything as if they were children. Mr. Fong thinks anyone who can invent a word processing system in Chinese must be a genius. Chan seems to be like a, everybody's projection. Yeah. That really got to me. I stopped watching it as a documentary or indie or a breakthrough. It's just a sheer movie moment that, no, I made a connection. It spoke to me. I remember being influenced by a lot of Ozu movies. And Ozu movies, he cuts to a lot of shots of empty spaces. Right. And the empty spaces speak a lot because a lot of times so much has happened usually with a family and all their emotions is left in the empty space. And he keeps the empty space on for a long time. So you can kind of then kind of read into it with your own feelings. But at the same time, your movie has to uh, prepare the audience to invest their emotion and, and imagination. It's not all empty. You do the groundwork. He came here and he want to be, uh, continue to be Chinese. Everything, thinking, doing things and all that. And of course, that presents a problem. When I was making Chan is Missing, and I wanted the story to be told about Chan from many people's perspective, rather than tell a typical story where he gets lost and then you know, you find out something about him, and then you find him. Uh, so I was trying to get away from that. Yeah, everybody down here calls him Hi-Ho. Yeah. Why do they call him Hi-Ho? Hi-Ho, because he always liked Hi-Ho cookies. He always had it in his... The Asians don't always tell stories with uh, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it's in sequence. You know, they tell stories from the perspective of characters rather than, rather than the beginning, middle, and end. So in that sense, it's a very, you know, Asian way of telling stories. Your movie kind of reminds me of Bicycle Thief. Mm -hmm. By tracing something, you did a roundabout social study. Yeah. And I think your movie has that vibe to me. So it's really about searching yeah. and yearning. I think that's emotional. Neorealism affected me because it was so authentic, everything. Uh, Rossellini and his films and whatnot. But Bicycle Thief really hit me emotionally. It sort of made me upset for like two or three days. I wanted to have that neorealism that I felt was important 
with China's missing. And real people. With real people and real people who have their own problems. So with bicycle thief, in those days after the war, you can't get a job and you lose the bicycle that gives you a job is so, 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 so heartbreaking. I was just trying to do a heartbreaking that was more acceptable for our time and our age at that time, which is, you know, some immigrant who comes over to America and cannot adjust, and he probably is lost somewhere. That to me is very, very key. So when you grew up in Hong Kong, I assume it's more or less like how I grew up in Taiwan. You see a lot of Hollywood movies and you see a lot of Hong Kong. I watched them in Mandarin, the Cathy movies earlier on, mm -hmm. then the Shaw Brothers. Those are the mainstream movies, but you also have the Cantonese movies. Mm -hmm. My father was much more interested in Hollywood movies. That's why he took me to film noir, he took me to John Wayne movies, and I was even named after him. <laughs> but he hated Chinese movies. Every time, let's say my mother would be watching some Chinese movies, he says, you know, don't watch that soap opera crap, you know? Uh, so I never was brought up very much by Chinese movies. The only one I can think of was Li Hanxiang, so I would say that he was the one that kind of became maybe an influence for me. And Li Hanxiang was very cultural and very historically well-read. Earlier on, you have Kim Hu, and he was one of the major group consultant. Yeah. Parties to Li Hanxiang. Yeah. So they make some more authentic Chinese language film. King Hu, his wuxia pian actually are very, very, very influential. Consciously about the Chinese aesthetic, yeah. But I realized that Chinese films are, are really influenced by Hollywood too. You know, their style is very Hollywood. Uh, if not Hollywood, there was a period where they were influenced by Russian films. So I think this is worth looking into, is like, what is it about our own Chinese aesthetics that can that can go into these films. You mentioned uh, how, how when you started, you're almost a part of the the Hong Kong New Wave in the right. late 70s. Yes, that was the first wave. So I wonder when that new wave Hong Kong happened in the late 80s and 90s. Zhang Wu, Wang Gaowei, and including me popping up in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> you keep making movie during that time. Do you feel like you're part of that Chinese wave? You know, when China's Missing was shown at the Edinburgh Film Festival, I remember going there and I met Edward Yang, Ho Xiao Xian, and Zhang Yimo. We all had our first films there. And the four of us went to eat fish and chips downtown in <laughs> Edinburgh. That was a very special moment. But for some reason, I was more in tune with the Taiwan filmmakers more than the China ones. Zhang Yimou is probably the one that I identify with most, especially films like Red Lantern and To Live and things like that. But Edward Yang was very interesting for me. And recently in Japan, they did a four-hour uncut version of Brighter Summer Day, which is a very powerful film. So I think there's a lot of similarities with that. Wong Kar Wai is a little different. You know, his film is more French to me than... Than Hong Kong. Than the Hong Kong. <laughs> there's something very European about his films, and I like them. I think in the 90s, there's a burst of a creative energy. His somehow socially the Chinese culture being repressed very long. There's a lot of yearning. It's like somehow we gotta get the steam out of the, the pot or something. It just mm -hmm. to me the nineties kind of the, the Chinese time. I'm very proud of being part of that culture, that, that burst. And now there's a whole nother another generation even. I mean between Taiwan and Japan, Hong Kong much less so because of the political situation and, and, and also they don't have distribution, so it's really hard to sort of, you know, make films in Hong Kong. It's Koreans' turn. <laughs> and Koreans, Koreans, yeah. Koreans turn. are really doing well. The films are shift around, as we say. And a lot of revenge and a lot of blood also. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, no, no. They make very good films, actually, also. Very human films about family and whatever. But it's all good. And the other thing that's interesting is, like, let's say I've been working with Netflix, and they have a lot more uh, Asian executives. And at least, I mean, they're not on the very high level, but at least they are sympathetic and they're pushing for more Asian projects. Whether they get done or not, or how they get done is still still to be seen. It's for the better. I hope it's for it the better. It came a long way, it came a long yeah. way. But all my career, I was looking for something about what makes Chinese films Chinese. You know, not just the characters, but uh, stylistically, how are they Chinese? One film I can think of is Yellow Earth, which is Chen Ka Ge and Zhang Yimou. And the visual and the way they framed everything really has a Chinese characteristic. If you look at Chinese paintings, there's something very unique and very different about it. It's always up looking down. It's a Chinese perspective of being able to see more. Because if you're on a higher angle looking down, you can actually see more. And they always put people very small. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're only part of nature. They're only part of nature. They're yeah. always very small. <laughs> so that's one perspective. So especially with landscapes and whatever, but when you get closer in, then everything is more eye level because the Chinese want to see everything being more equal rather than one part of the frame being more important than others. And I think that's probably more instinctive with us too because of how we see things. It's not so distorted and so, so exaggerated. It's more balanced. So through my whole career, I thought, how can I make a truly Chinese film with not just Chinese characters, but stylistically Chinese. And I think that's a good question for the next generation. I guess the use of negative space. Yes, exactly. And again, going back to the water shots that you were talking about, for me, it was yin and yang, and it's about negative space a lot. I look at that water shot and I go, you know, this is, this is important. This is more important than saying something very specific or telling a story or whatever. And I wish that films could try to take the images and really let people read into that with their own feelings rather than you have to think like this. <laughs> and also last night I watched a film called Mio on the Shore. It's a Japanese film. And the Japanese take their time with things. And sometimes you see that in some Chinese films. But I really appreciate it. As I get older and older especially, you know, you look at all these Hollywood Marvel films, they just cut like this, you know. So I'm going to make the longest movie ever and really take my, <laughs> take my time with my shots. <laughs> well, good luck. Good luck with the premiere. <laughs> but I think one thing is that we both work with humanity. And I think that that's something that I've always respected and I always could depend on no matter what film you made. Uh, whether it's Hulk, whether it's Pi, you know, I could always look for that humanity. Indeed. I, I, I think yeah. that's very important, too. That is something a lot of films are forgetting these days. Tanto tiempo disfrutamos. And I think it's really important for me. I think I want to see a film because of the humanity that's being portrayed in the story. <laughs> Si negaras mi presencia en tu vivir, bastaría con abrazarte y conversar. Tanta vida yo te di que por fuerzas llevarás sabor a mí.